So reading through these songs, uh, you know, I used to say something a lot. I haven't said it in a while, but when you when you start messing with this book, it starts messing with you. And I've been reading through the songs, and David's really messing with me. Uh, and so I want to clarify what I meant earlier. I want to worship the Lord always. There's a deep desire in me to worship the Lord. I just don't feel like it sometimes. So I want to worship him. I just don't feel like it. And what's amazing is David in, in the Psalms, we see that same type of sentiment. He's like, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? And then he gets to the end and like, you're amazing. You're wonderful. And he still worships. He still he still worships. So as you find your seat, I hope that you've been reading along with us through the Psalms, and I hope as you've been messing with this book, you realize that you've been messing with a person. Because this when we get in the Word, the Word is a person. His name is Jesus. And when you start interacting with him relationally through his word, he starts interacting with you. And as we talked about before, man, you can't step away from the presence of God the same. He, he messes with you. If we surrender and submit ourselves to him, we give him the glory due his name. Man, he humbles us changes our heart and he helps us see us helps us see ourselves for who we truly are and him for who he truly is and that's what this psalm is about psalm 29 so if you have a bible and i hope you do find your way over to psalm 29 and as you find your way there i'm gonna uh about two or three years ago i guess man no that's probably three or four years ago now um, we were at our house in, in Clinton, and Eleanor got a boomerang. Uh, she got a boomerang, and, and she was like, Dad, show me how to play with a boomerang. And, you know, y'all know how kids are. Like, they have, this, they have this understanding of their father that they can do everything, like, which is not always true. Uh, it's never true, actually, but... But sometimes they, you know, they think that because, you know, dads typically can uh, do some things that they can't do. So it feels like they can do everything. And so, so Eleanor was like, show me how to throw this boomerang and play with this boomerang. <laughs> Listen, can I just confess to you, I'm not the, I'm not the world's greatest boomerang thrower. Uh, the idea of a boomerang, I'm sure you know, is like you throw it, you throw it a certain way and it kind of goes up and comes around and it comes back to you. Uh, I definitely haven't perfected that method with the boomerang. Uh, and that was quite obvious on this day uh, when multiple times I threw the boomerang and it went in a tree and got stuck and I had to shake it out of the tree. And then eventually how it happened was I threw the boomerang and it landed on the roof and I was like, I think we're done with the boomerang. <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I'm not great with the boomerang. Uh, here's what I want to talk to us. I typically don't title sermons or whatever. I don't even know if this is a title. Maybe it's just a topic or a subject. What I want to talk to you about today from Psalm 29 is what I call boomerang strength. I believe this is what David has in mind, boomerang strength. I'll talk about that later. So if you've got your word and you found Psalm 29, did you say word? Let's get into the Word so the Word can get into us. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. The glory, the God of glory thunders. The Lord above the vast. The voice of the Lord in power, the voice of the Lord in splendor, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. 
The voice of the Lord flashes flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the woodlands bare. In his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned above the flood. The Lord sits enthroned, king forever. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we come to you and we just ask you. We ask you to speak to us through your word. Lord, we want to hear the voice of the Lord, the one that flashes, the one that is strong, that is majestic, that shakes the wilderness. We want to hear from you, Lord, because the reality is life can make our hearts stony and hard and we need them shaken. May we be a people like that, like that, like that. That's how, that's how life goes. We need to hear from you. We need to hear from you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Ascribe to the Lord. <laughs> this is exactly how I felt things were going to go this week. No, it's all good. No worries. No, no apologies needed. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. This word, heavenly beings, is, is talking about those who occupy heaven. The, the beings that are in heaven, it's translated different things. Sometimes it's translated sons of God. This is just monikers for the same types of things. But David is, David is, is, is calling out, and he's, it's almost as if he's, he's giving a command. This word, ascribe, means to give. He's saying, give to the Lord. Give to the Lord. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. So right here, real quick, you have uh, you have a who, you have a what, and then you have uh, 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 the, the reason why or the why. Ascribe to the Lord who, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord what? Glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord why should you give him glory and strength? Because he's do it according to his name. I'm not going to go over the name thing. Name, character. Remember, name equals character. Nature. And then you see in the very next verse, it's ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord, ascribe to the Lord. And then it's ascribe to the Lord. Nope. Worship. Worship. This is the essence and idea of worship. Worship is an experience of the totality of our being. It's, it's not just, because when we look at this word worship, real quickly, ascribe, ascribe, ascribe. Who? Heavenly beings. Why? Because he's due it his, because he's due glory and honor because of his name. Now worship, this word worship actually is the root word of this is to bow down. It means to get on your hands and knees, to lay prostrate before the Lord. And he says, ascribe, 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 and then bow down or worship. It's a, it's a picture of when we ascribe to the Lord his strength and his glory. It's a literal bowing down of our entire being. The totality of who we are is, is re releasing and giving up ourselves and bowing down before him and ascribing to him. He's the one who is strength. He is the one who is glory, value, waiting. It's bowing down in reverence. Here's the deal. Bowing down in reverence should be the posture of our lives, even when we don't feel like it. I told you when we read 1 Chronicles chapter 16, already we read the song of thanksgiving. And what's happening in this is, as I referenced already, the Ark of the Covenant is being brought into the tent in Jerusalem. And David is dancing at the front of the parade. And I shared this with our men. And we're going to go more in depth than this in a series around prayer in the future. But just suffice it to say, um, David, David is the king. And he is entering Jerusalem for the first time as king. It's been years upon years upon years since he was 
when, since he was anointed by Samuel as king, and it's been even more years since Saul has been reigning, and he's been on the run and all types of other things. And now he's had all this time to plan his, his entrance into the city as king. And here's how kings would ride into the city. There would be this huge parade, you should think, Aladdin, um, and the whole, like, a genie, and they're singing, and there's all of the, the performance that goes on in front. There's music, there's, there's singing, there's um, expressions of power and all of that. And then at the very end, the last one to come in would be the king on his horse. And here's what David does. He comes in, parades the same, but David is not in kingly gear, he's in priestly gear. In fact, he's not even in priestly gear, he's in the underwear of a priest. Because he doesn't consider himself worthy to even wear the priestly clothes. And he's not at the back, he's at the front. And he's dancing and worshiping in the Lord. And you know what's in the back? As the king enters, he's in the front. You know what's in the back? The Ark of the Covenant. The thing that is the presence of God. He's saying, listen, your king's right up here dancing, but the thing to really look towards is the thing at the back. It's the presence of God, and he's made his presence known here in Jerusalem. And he is worshiping with everything. When we read this text, we see he's changed his clothing. He's dancing around. He's changed his position in the parade. He's done everything. Everything about David's posture is a posture of humility and bowing down in worship before the Lord. And then he gives that song of thanksgiving. The Lord is great and highly to be praised. The king is being ushered into the city, and typically the songs would be how wonderful and the glory of our people, the glory of the people is our king, as I talked about last week. And here David gives a song, and he says, The Lord is great and highly to be praised. He's feared of all the gods. All the gods of the peoples, those are worthless idols, but the Lord, he's made the heavens. Splendor, majesty are before him. In Psalm 29, David's calling back to this song of thanksgiving. See, worship is about the totality of our being giving it to the Lord. And if I'm just going to be honest and candid to you, one of the things that I struggle with is worshiping with the totality of my being. I am personality trait more subdued and calm. And one of my, if I can just be honest with you as a church, one of my fears for us and one of the Longings of my heart that has even been rooted even further into my heart through reading the Psalms and reading about David through the Psalms is that we would more and more become a church who worships God well with the totality of our being that we don't just sing songs but we, we lift our hands and we bow down and we, 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 we express what He means to us not with just our lips with the beautiful song but with the totality of our beings not just on Sunday but also through the week. Amen. And I feel like I haven't led us well in that in this specific environment. And David has messed with me. The Lord has messed with me through the person of David as I read through the song. So I want to Worships as an experience of the totality of my being. The psalmist moves on, David moves on, and he, he begins to talk about the voice of the Lord. But before I get to the voice of the Lord and talk about it a little bit, I just kind of want to walk through this really, really quickly. The voice of the Lord is above the waters. Uh, the glory, the God of glory thunders the Lord above the vast waters. Here's the picture. Um, the waters is always a reference to, uh, typically it's a reference geographically to the Mediterranean Sea. Um, that's the place where humans can exist, right? Like imagine yourself 2,000 years ago. Where, do humani where does humanity not thrive? Well, in the water. Like 
uh, we, we can only swim for a little while, and then there's monsters in there that eat us. Think back to Jonah, you know? And so it's the place where humanity can't th survive. The humanity can't thrive. It's the picture of the Mediterranean Sea. And so what we have is we have this geographical, here, here's the picture. David is witnessing a storm, and storms in this region are absolutely brutal. They are, they are rough, 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 rough thunderstorms. And he's, he's standing in the north, which is called Lebanon. And imagine there's huge mountain peaks, uh, specifically Mount Sirion, or actually we typically call it Mount Hermon. And there's all kinds of theological baggage that hangs around on that that I don't have to go into. Just suffice it to say, it is a representation of pagan gods all throughout the land because it's the biggest mountain. Okay, so Mount Hermon is referenced in this verse, uh, in these verses. Lebanon is mentioned. The cedars of Lebanon are, Lebanon are mentioned. mentioned. Uh, for us, understand that the cedars in Lebanon are the biggest trees known to man in that time. So for us, we would think of the sequoias in the redwood forest. So just when you read that thing, dude, you, you break the cedars. Like the biggest, the biggest living thing that we can think of, that's the cedars in Lebanon. When the voice of God speaks, it breaks those. The biggest mountain that we can that we can picture and see, the largest mountain, Mount Hermon for them, dude. It 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 shakes like a young calf. It's it ta it's talking. The language here is like, have you ever seen? I don't know. Like, have you ever seen a calf be, like soon as it's birthed, as it tries to like stand up, it's like all wobbly. He says that was that's what the mountain looks like when God speaks. All wobbly. It just shakes and trembles at the voice of the Lord. The, the largest mountain shakes and bounces around at the voice of the Lord. The largest structures, living structures that we know, the cedars of Lebanon, they shake and break and splinter at the voice of the Lord. And so picture, he's on Lebanon up in the north. There's a storm coming over the waters of the Mediterranean. And typically how the storms go, they come for you guys. Let's think about it this way. The Mediterranean Sea's here. Lebanon's up here. And then Kadesh is down here. And so this storm comes over the Mediterranean. It comes over the north. And then it comes down to the south in Kadesh. So it covers the entirety of Israel. So it's the voice of the Lord metaphorically in, in the picture analogous uh, in this storm is moving over the waters which is the place where humanity can exist into the north the place where the biggest mountains and the biggest structures are all the way to the desert of Kadesh the voice of the Lord thunders over all of that over every bit of it he shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. Just a side note here, when you read the Bible and you read like Lebanon, like do a reference and go see where that word pops up and that place pops up in the other parts of the Bible. And, and the author is drawing you to download that map onto, onto what you're reading. Kadesh, download. Kadesh is the place where the people of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. So when Kadesh is mentioned here, it's not just as a place. It's actually a time. The Lord sat enthroned over the people of Israel while they wandered in the desert. You ever wondered where God was when you were wandering? Right there with you. His voice was right over top of that, shaking the wilderness that you were in. So the whole point in the idea of this whole section right here, verses 3 through 9... Is that the Lord is over heaven and earth. Simple point. Nothing pretty about it. It just is. The Lord is over heaven and earth. And he gives all of these descriptions about what that looks like. And he makes this equation between the Lord and the voice of the Lord. And this happens all throughout Scripture. When you hear on the very first part, the voice of the Lord is above the waters, guess where that should take you? Come on, y'all know this. Genesis chapter 1. He says, God created everything in the, and the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the waters. 
David is calling us back to creation, even in this. He's calling us back to creation. God is the one. The voice of God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. When God speaks, creation comes into fruition. It comes into being. It begins to exist at that moment when God speaks. And David is watching this storm over the Mediterranean as it moves over Lebanon and down to the south. And he is reminded of the power of the voice of God as the thunder in the storm rages and the lightning flashes. He's like, this is what the voice of the Lord is like. It shakes and rattles all of creation. Why? Because all of creation was created by him at the sound of his voice. So when the sound of his voice happens, all of creation listens attentively and moves accordingly. Amen? What's strange about it is David is reminding us as his creation, so should we. It's interesting that all of God's creation moves and responds to the voice of the Lord. However, we, I don't know what we do sometimes. So biblically, as we look at the voice of the Lord, this flows all the way through scripture. We see the voice of the Lord at the very beginning. It created the heavens and the earth. Also, the voice of the Lord is, is the very, it interacts with humanity, corporately and personally. You think back through the stories, right? You have, you have Noah where God comes and speaks to him and says, listen, but it, you, need to, you, need to build this, you need to build this boat because there's going to th be this thing that comes from the sky, and it's called water. Uh, and so it's going to flood the entire earth, and all the, all the waters underneath here, psh, Boom. It's going to be a worldwide place where humanity can't thrive. So i got to create something for you to survive in. I'm going to make an ark, and you're going to be the one to make it. God's voice speaks. Noah responds. And then something begins to take place in human history by God's voice. Abraham, God speaks to Abraham, calls him out of the Ur of the Chaldeans and said, Listen, I'm going to give him purpose and says, I'm going to call you out of your father's house to a new land. Go there. You're going to be a father of many nations. And, and I'm, going to, I'm going to bring up a nation out of you that's going to be my chosen people. And through that chosen people, I'm going to bring blessing to the entire world, to all nations. God speaks. Speaks to Jacob. Speaks to Joseph. Speaks to Moses, speaks to Joshua, speaks to Gideon. Elijah, Ezekiel is brought into like, this dream and he's transported from Babylon into, into the, a new temple. And he walks, God, God, the presence of God is with him and walks him through this new temple. And the heavens open up and he sees, he sees heaven and the temple of God for all that it is. voice of God interacts with humanity corporately and personally. God speaks to Israel on a corporate level. He speaks to his church on a corporate level. Jesus speaks to, to groups of people. And he speaks to individuals. Jesus, in John 1, 1, is referred to as the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was, he was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him and apart from Him. Not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. But Jesus is the Word of God in the flesh interacting with humanity. And here in this in this text, in Psalm 29, David is connecting it, a, a storm. He's witnessing a storm. And as the wind blows and the thunder crashes and lightning flies from heaven and splits and splinters different things and shakes different things, he's like, this is what the voice of God is like. The voice of God is like this. I want to draw your attention to the disciples and the apostles in Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost had arrived. We were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like that of a rushing wind. So a storm comes in, came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues of, of, of like flames of fire that separated 
and rested on each one of them. This is the same type of storm language happening as the voice of God now, not in the person of Jesus, but in his apostles, the voice of God going out through his people. The Lord is over the heaven and the earth, and his voice, his voice created the heavens and the earth, it interacts with humanity in all of the Old Testament characters. We see it in Jesus. We see it in the apostles. And the voice of the Lord makes everything happen. In Acts chapter 17, it says, For in Him we live and move and have our being, as even some of you of your own poets have said. It's calling on even pagan and non-Christian, non-followers of Jesus, poets, that said that God, it's in God that we have. And, and, and the writer here is saying, listen, it's not just in some God, it's in the God, Yahweh. Colossians 1.16, Paul says, For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, where the things on earth, things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Like, is there anything that God is not sustaining, holding together? Is there anything, let's say it this way, that Jesus is not the creator of, sustainer of, keeper of, judge of? No, he, he holds it. Uh, he makes everything happen. Hebrews 2.10 says, For in bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was entirely appropriate that God, for whom and through whom all things exist. Did you hear that? For whom and through whom all things exist should make the pioneer of our salvation perfect through suffering. You know what's amazing? Jesus was never more sovereign, more controlled than when he was hanging on a cross dying for me and you. He was allowing it, making it happen. The Lord is over heaven and earth. He sustains all things. If I'm getting loud this morning and excited about it, it's because I need to be reminded. He moves from verses 3 through 9. Voice of the Lord, 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 over and over and over. He's trying to drive something home. We need to understand the voice of the Lord and who that points to. It points to a person named Jesus. And then it says, in his temple all cry glory. In verse 9, we see that this full body Worship, the totality of our being type of worship is taking place in the temple. He, he tells the heavenly beings, ascribe to the Lord strength and glory. Ascribe to him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness, his separateness. And then he says this, it's in his temple. If you know anything about the temple and the tabernacle that preceded it, when you, when you read, this is why we should read those really boring texts that just give explanations about things, because it's really helpful. And one of the things that you will read about when it comes to the tabernacle and the temple is, is this inside, the decor inside the temple, and specifically the Holy of Holies, was all guarded imagery. It was all guarded imagery. It was a picture of the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, in the Bible, was this place where heaven and earth overlapped, where God walked alongside man. They both existed in this one place. Earth is not heaven, and heaven is not earth, 
But the Garden of Eden was a place where those, those two things overlapped and coexisted. And the temple and the tabernacle, specifically the Holy of Holies, was, was painted and decorated in such a way to give us garden imagery because it was also a place where that overlaps. That's why Ezekiel, when he's ushered into the temple in Jerusalem, he looks up and sees the temple in heaven. It's because that's a place where heaven and earth overlap. Meaning that's a place where humanity and people uh, or humanity and God can coexist. The presence of God is made manifest with his people. This is what happens with Moses. As, as, this is why all the people, I say this all the time, this is why all the people in Israel, when, when Moses would go into the tent of meeting, this is why they would, all the men would stand up at their, at their tent doors and they would watch as one man entered into the presence of God. In awe, longing, all of them longing. I wish we got to go and experience the presence of God, but only one man got to. It's the place of heaven and earth. It's the garden imagery. It's the place where humanity experiences the presence of Yahweh because he's not, our, hear me, our God is not far off. I don't care what you feel like. I mean, I do care what you feel like, and we can talk about your feelings and all of those things. I don't mean it in that manner. But what I'm saying, it does, God's presence is not dependent upon your feelings. This is one of the things I'm so thankful for Stu. Like, he leads us in that. Like, week in and week out. Like, you don't got to go searching for God's presence. You ain't got to get it to come down here. Like, he's made himself home. Like, he's already done all the work to get here to us. Like, we just have to open our eyes and see it. And hear me, hear me. I understand how hard that is sometimes. It's hard for us to open our eyes and see the presence of God. Moses in the tabernacle. David in the tent. Go and read these stories. Ezekiel in the new temple. Think about Zechariah when he goes in, into the temple. And God hasn't spoke for, for years upon years. 400 years approximately. And he goes in and then boom, he's in the Holy of Holy. And God comes down and speaks to him about a son he's going to have. He's going to be the messenger. He's going to be the one crying out in the wilderness. He'll be, he'll be that prophet Elijah who paves the way for the coming of the Lord. This all happens there, the presence of God in the temple. Then we get to Jesus, and he's hanging on a cross. He gives up his last breath, and the veil is torn. That means that he has just made a way for each and every one of us. The thing that all those people were longing for when Moses went into the tent, now we have access to that tent. We have access to the garden. Not in full, not in totality, but in, in, a, in, a, in a way that it, it happens here on earth. God invites us into areas and experiences where heaven and earth overlap. It's the Jacob's ladder where he lays his head down in this normal place that you never would have expected. And God shows up and he opens his eyes. And here, God is at work coming down. How many of us have experienced temple-like experiences in the most mundane, random places? Most often, that's where God makes his presence known to us. The veil has been torn, church. The temple now, because what Jesus said, I'll tear the temple down, I'll raise it up in three days. He was talking about himself. And then he says, all those who follow me find themselves in Christ. So now you're in him. He's the temple. So guess what you are? You're the temple. You are the place where the presence of God exists now in this world. You and I, we're not going to search. We don't have to go on a search for the Lord. He's, he's with us and in us. We seek his word and he speaks to us. He speaks to us through our brothers and sisters, through encouragement. Full body worship should take place within the fullness of our body. Like if everything I've just said is true, I'm about to go old Southern Baptist on y'all and pull my coat off and go another 45 minutes. <laughs> or Pentecostal or whatever. I think this happens multiple places. It's a good tradition though because uh, that Paul did it. He preached all night one time. The guy fell out the window. Y'all remember that? Full body worship should take place in the fullness of our body. My question is, if all of this is true, like, like if, if, if his voice is powerful and splendid and it, and it breaks the, 
the biggest structures that we can even think of. It shakes the largest mountains that we can think of. If it covers the entirety of our existence, all of Israel, all of the known world for them at their time. If it expands all of that, if that is the voice of the Lord, and the voice of the Lord has made itself flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and he, he didn't just come here and like condemn us all, he came here and died for us all. If that is true, how do we, how do I, not we, I'm going to make this as personal as I can, how can I stand monotone in worship before my Lord? I'm convicted. And it doesn't happen overnight. But I'm just asking you, what does it look like for full body worship to take place with you? The totality of your being truly worshiping the Lord. Here's the deal, man. Like Jesus stretched wide for us. We should stretch wide for him. Jesus brought, was brought to his knees for us. We, we should go to our knees for him. Jesus was brought to tears for us. We should be brought to tears for him. Jesus was brought to silence for us. We should be brought to silence for him. Jesus was brought to crying out and screaming to his father for us. We should be brought to crying out for him. And then I want to draw your attention to the beauty and the reality of this. And why we should do it when we don't even feel like it. Verse 10 and 11, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. That is speaking of the big flood. Like even when that was happening, he was still reigning. I don't know what you're going through, what flood in your life is happening but it's not a worldwide flood. And so, like, the Lord was enthroned over that one. It's, it's, and a rainbow showed up at the end. The Lord sits enthroned king forever. <laughs> Just pause right there. That is the Lord. He's that powerful. That wonderful. He speaks. Stars pop into it. that humble, that he would leave everything in heaven and submit himself to humanity. Not just humanity, but that of a, a man who never, wasn't even born in a home, never had no kingdom, had no, had no crown. Never had a place to lay his head. The only crown he was given was one that was meant to mock him. that humble. Period. My mama used to say, okay, bar the door. It's over. We should worship him and lift our with the fullness of our body. Nothing else needed. However, he doesn't just do that. He goes the extra mile. He says, listen, I don't care how good you are at throwing the boomerang. When you when you throw the boomerang, when you give and ascribe to me strength and glory, the Lord gives his people strength. It comes back to you. Boomerang strength. The Lord gives his people strength. The Lord blesses his people with peace. When we give glory and strength do his name in worship, he gives it back to us. He doesn't just suck it up so he can sit on his prideful high horse and be like, look how awesome I am. No, he engages that and pours it back into us. He inhabits the praises of his people. He himself, he doesn't just give us strength. He gives us the one who is strength. He just doesn't give us counsel. He gives us the counselor, right? What's better than getting counsel? Have the counselor with you all the time. Amen. Boomerang strength. That's a, a 
ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Luke tells us that Jesus' birth is inaugurated and brought in by the singing of heavenly beings. Not to the kings of the day, but to the shepherds. That's just one picture of God making his presence known in the praises of his people. In the praises of his beings. Here's the struggle. And I think I've already made this kind of clear. It seems hardest to give strength to the Lord when we need peace and strength the most. However, we don't give it, we don't get it. When we don't give it, we don't get it. So church, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord glory be to his name. Worship God of glory thunders the Lord is above the vast waters. The voice of the Lord in power. The voice of the Lord in splendor. The voice of the Lord, it breaks the cedars. It shatters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syria like a wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness, the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strip the woodlands bare. He brings life and, well, he strips the woodlands bare. So in his temple, all cry glory. Are you crying glory with the totality of your being? Because the Lord sits enthroned over the flood, the greatest catastrophe that the world has ever seen. The Lord sits enthroned, king forever. And David says, out of all the things that God's got going on in his universe, the Lord gives. Here's what I'm going to ask us to do. You don't give it, you don't get it. And Stu's going to lead us. And I'm not asking anybody to like get crazy and jump in the baptistry or run across the top of the chairs or any of, I don't, I don't know. Like, But what does it look like for you to fully worship the Lord? And maybe you just take one step in that direction. Maybe you take one step in that direction. And what I know from experience is when you do that, he will give you strength. He'll fill you up. He'll prepare you for what's ahead. <laughs> 